in England's rough island story is that sweep of the Channel Coast from Portland to the start. Second to none in its hilly is this rounded bight in the coast's most westerly end, Tor Bay. Facing north on Tor Bay and snug in its own little cup of cliff and sea sits the town of Brixham. Today, as for hundreds of years, Brixham's chief industry is fishing. It claims, in fact, to be the mother town of fisheries. Not without reason, at least where deep sea trawling is concerned. Almost anywhere in the English-speaking world, say Brixham, and it's certain someone will say trawlers. The men of Suffolk and Norfolk perhaps may deny it, but Brixham maintains that the great east coast fishing ports of Lowestoft and Grimsby owe their origin to Brixham men who settled there years ago. During the late war, scores of fishing vessels from all about the northwest shores of Europe came here for haven and employment. They still give Brixham a picturesque foreign touch by putting in to discharge catches and for refitting. Ostend, Cancal, Fécamp, Caen. To see the market idle is to have no hint of its activity when the spoils of the sea are landed. Brixham is mentioned in the doomsday records of the 11th century. 200 years later, in 1310, it was helping its neighbour Dartmouth to fit and furnish a ship for the king, Henry III. From this shore and these jetties, men and munitions were embarked for the D-Day invasion of France. But that is all in a piece with Brixham's long story. Nearly 400 years ago, these cliffs had first proof that Spain's mighty armada was not so invincible as King Philip imagined. In 1588, Francis Drake brought the first captured vessel into Torbay. He left the galleon and 400 prisoners in the charge of Brixham's older men. Then, no doubt with plenty of the younger men of Brixham and their tiny vessels, he went back to his job of drumming the dons up the channel to their destruction. Brixham takes pride in its connection with that peaceful revolution of the 1680s from which sprang English religious tolerance and government of the people by the people. On the 5th of November, 1688, the Prince of Orange, William III, landed here. The event and William's declaration are commemorated in this statue. Yes, an old town, Brixham, straggling uphill and then down in streets that tack from larboard to starboard. This church stands as a memorial to the author of a hymn noted and greatly loved throughout the English-speaking world. Henry Francis Light, who wrote Abide With Me. For a round hundred years, as these words are spoken, Abide With Me has carried comfort and blessing to millions spread over our earth. Of the man who wrote it, and of its completion a few weeks before his death in November 1847, Beyond question, that is historic Brixham's finest story. It was at Ednam in the Scottish border country that Henry Francis Light was born to troublous times. The French Revolution was in being, the long wars of Napoleon darkened the horizon. The marriage of Henry's parents was an unhappy one. When the boy was between seven and eight, his mother and father separated. He never saw his mother again. In 1803, the father, Captain Thomas Light, left Henry and his elder brother in the charge of the Reverend Dr. Burroughs at Portora Royal School in Esquillen, Ireland. And then, apparently, he forgot them. Henry was at Portora for six years, said to be flighty, if amiable, but of extraordinary talent, 
He then was entered at Trinity College, Dublin, as a sighter. Winning the Chancellor's Prize for English Verse three years in succession and a scholarship, he graduated in 1814. Over six foot in height, very handsome, witty, well-read, a brilliant speaker and a poet, he had every grace and talent for fame of a worldly kind. But, first studying medicine, he turned to religion. He was ordained priest at the age of 21. In the beginning, Henry Light's attitude to his professed faith was the clever young man's, of the brain rather than the heart. The death, however, of a neighbouring clergyman in South Ireland had a deep effect on him. In its simple piety, the dying man's confession of faith convicted him of shallowness. At the age of 21, Henry Francis Light found himself at life's crossroads. With a new heart and mind, he applied himself to a deeper study of the sources of his beliefs. His instinctive kindliness towards his fellow men now discovered a truer inspiration. He dedicated himself under God to the higher service of his kind. Characteristically, he tackled the first good work he found to hand. The affairs of the widow and young children left by the dead man were in disorder. Light set himself to the task of putting them right. It proved an exacting task, overloaded with responsibility and causes for anxiety. Coming on top of exhausting study, it brought a complete breakdown in his health. He was warned that if he wanted to survive, he would have to leave Ireland and recuperate on the continent. As a result of that first illness, Henry Francis Light never again was a really fit man. But a prolonged tour abroad did restore a measure of health, and he obtained a curacy at Mara Zion near St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall. It was here that he met his future wife, Anne Maxwell. By the time their marriage was blessed with the first of a family of four, Marazion winters were affecting Light's health adversely. The family moved to the village of Sway near Lymington. The rest at Sway improved his health considerably. Anxious to be active in the ministry, he obtained a curacy in South Devon and dwelt at Dittisham on the Dart. His preaching took him all about the district. He was often seen and heard in Brixham. Canning, the great statesman, had been much taken by a sermon preached by Light and he took the trouble to make Light aware of his admiration. This powerful interest was one that any clergyman of Light's manifest abilities might justifiably have cultivated. But Light had no mind for rising through influence to deanery or bishopric. A chapel had been built near the quays in Lower Brixham to ease the crowded condition of the parish church uptown. Light had been invited to accept the pulpit. If he used influence at all, most likely it was to have the barn-like structure constituted as a separate parish church. This was effected in 1826, Henry Francis Light being installed as its first vicar. Whatever his parishioners may have thought of their new parson, the tall, scholarly man, so obviously frail in health, it wasn't long before he won their hearts. He won them by sheer force of character, by his sincerity. It was plain that he put his calling first and sought no personal esteem or worldly credit. He was so anxious that his parishioners, men and women close each day to the perils of the sea, should try their best to walk with God, that it mattered little to him what sect or denomination they belonged to. His own wife, Anne, was a Methodist, and each Sunday the Brixham folk would see the Anglican parson and his wife drive up to the Wesleyan Chapel. Having handed his wife up the chapel steps, Light would then go on to his own church, calling back for her on the way home.
almost the first of his parishioners to detect his innate kindliness were the children. He had only to appear on the roads about Brixham to have strings of them after him for the sweets he invariably carried to give them. It would appear, however, that the warmest interest in Light's pastorship lay among the fishermen and their kin. The hardships and dangers of their calling were ever in his mind. The fishermen, for their part, putting aside the old superstitions they attached even to the sight of a clergyman, welcomed the visits of Light to their vessels. It was a care with Light to see that no Brixham vessel sailed without a Bible for the skipper's use at sea. Light was the fisherman's vicar for over 20 years. The house occupied by Henry Francis Light during the later years in Brixham was the old hospital of the dismantled fort on Berry Head, a bleak utilitarian building standing in probably still bleaker grounds. It was transformed by Light into a comparatively comfortable dwelling. The grounds were his particular care. On an evening in the late summer of 1847, Henry Francis Light walked in his garden. The last four years of his ministry had been sad. He had been forced, on medical advice, to spend the winters abroad. In his absences, strife had broken out in his congregation. His choir had deserted him. He was dying of consumption. Like many another man of imagination and courage, all his life, Light had feared not the hereafter, but the act of dying. Now he knew that act was near. Presently, with some of his family, he was going abroad again. But even so, the time he might gain could only be brief. It had been a lovely day, and now the sun was descending over distant Dartmoor. In the dying man, all the ambition which, had he been a worldling, could have given him fame in his lifetime, was focused on one desire. Eight years earlier, this last desire had been expressed in verse. And now, as he moved to his favorite seat on the cliffside, his prayer was finding its answer. The inspiration for the great hymn, which was to bring comfort to millions then alive and as yet unborn, had come to him fully after eight years. Suffering, deserted by many, he yet saw that his whole life had been blessed by divine presence. It had come to him at the crossroads near Wexford and had been with him in every moment of doubt and of happiness. And now that the even tide of his life was fast falling, he was assured the same presence would be with him into the unknown. It was thought by his family that he was resting indoors, but his gardener, Charles Potter, knew where he was and had become anxious. Master. What is it, Charles? It is getting late. The dew falls heavy. Might I be so bold as to say, come indoors. A moment or two, Charles. I must finish a work that too long has eluded me. Wait for me nearby. As you will, Master. O oh Lord, thy voice for me still, as it was in Emmaus. Hold then thy cross before my closing eyes. Speak through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death. O oh Lord, abide with me. Henry Francis Light died at Nice on November the 20th, 1847. The news came to Brixham and the people sorrowed greatly. The fishermen asked for a service of remembrance in All Saints. 
This was the first time that Abide With Me was sung in public. Vast crowds sing it even at sports gatherings. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a very special announcement to make to you that this is the centenary year of the composition of this great hymn, Abide With Me. And I want you please to sing it as you've never sung it before. Number 11. since has it brought in times of strain and stress to millions all over the world. It has closed the dying lips of saints, sinners and heroes alike. That devoted woman, Edith Cavill, whispered it as she walked serenely to her death. Ernest Shackleton, dying amid the unpitying snows, asked to hear it on the gramophone. Our good king, George V, loved it. Its strains bore him to his rest. effort of a dying man, Abide With Me remains a hymn for the living. For how shall man or woman fare serenely through life's little day, save in walking with God? <laughs> <laughs> 